going, we don't need roads. With this unforgettable line closing Back to the Future 1, Doc rebukes Marty's doubts. Hey Doc, we gotta back up, we don't have enough road to get up to 88. And to the surprise of his girlfriend Jennifer, lifts his DeLorean into the sky, ready to fly them into the future in 2015. I'm sure you know the rest of the story, but did you ever ask yourself why a DeLorean and who designed it? Well, the DMC-12, which is arguably one of the most iconic cars in Hollywood cinematography, was a real car. It was released in 1981 by the DeLorean Motor Company, a brand established a few years prior by John DeLorean, former executive at General Motors, who had ambitions to completely reinvent the automotive industry. Well, the DMC-12 was his first model and its high-tech and lavish design was meant to propel his concept into the future. However, a year later, scandals, poor management and broken promises soon led DeLorean to close the company and discontinue production. While his DMC-12 immediately became a collector's must-have, its ultra-modern allure also fueled the imagination of Robert Zemeckis, who chose it as the key object of his Back to the Future saga in 1985. Its rarity and the movie surely contributed to the car's posthumous celebrity, but at the time of its release, its aura of grandeur mainly came from its lines and style, authored by none other than the Italian master designer Giorgetto Giugiaro. It was 1977 when DeLorean commissioned his first model from the world's hottest designer as part of his grand plan to revolutionize the car industry. At the time, Giugiaro was already a celebrated style maker, especially after the 1974 success of his Volkswagen Golf, which had skyrocketed the German brand's sales. A few years later, in 1980, while designing the DeLorean, Giugiaro would repeat himself, revamping another historic car maker, the Italian Fiat, with his iconic Panda, one of the most sold cars in Italy. Well, if you observe the Volkswagen Golf and the Fiat Panda, you might notice a similar look, based on wedges and straight lines, an angular feature which would later be defined as origami style. The DeLorean reflects the traits of Giugiaro's work in the 1970s, a style which we later see in his 1979 Lancia Delta or 1984 Seat Ibiza, and which dates back to the Maserati Boomerang of 1972, the first project of his independent firm Ital Design and a long-lasting model of imitation. In this context, DeLorean hired Giugiaro because he wanted from him the most memorable sports car of his time. Now, beyond his commercial success, what made Giugiaro's style so special? How did he become the car designer of the century in 1999? This will be the topic of our conversation today. Giugiaro was born in 1938, 60 miles south of Turin, in the hilly village of Garessio, at the border of Piedmont and Liguria. He came from a family of artists. His grandfather Luigi painted church frescoes and his father Mario alternated between decorative religious art and oil painting. As a kid, Giorgetto tagged along and watched them paint Madonnas or pastoral scenes on any kind of surface, whether flat, curved or uneven. What he learned from them was the ability to draw on diverse planes, an attentiveness to light and shade, so the volume of things, and the tension that turns lines, curves and flares into emotional tools. Aware of his artistic and technical talent, his father sent him off to a professional school in Turin in 1952 to study rendering, costume design and technical drawing. He was there that he learned how to move from painting to planning. He was there that he discovered design as the third dimension of art. Now, the Turin School had been founded by Eugenio Colmo, a native of Garessio, classmate of the poet Guido Gozzano, and a famous caricaturist known since the 1920s as Golia. Colmo's nephew, Dante Giacosa, was the technical director of Fiat and the creator of the Fiat Topolino in 1936, the most successful car produced by the company up to that point. It was Giacosa who first noticed an automobile sketch by the young kid at the school's end-of-the-year exhibition of projects. It was June 1955. Three months later, the 17-year-old Giugiaro was already working at Fiat 
as an apprentice in the Special Vehicle Design Study Department. In his early career, two events greatly impacted his imaginative mind. In 1957, his scout, Giacosa, released the Fiat 500, a new compact car which would popularize the automobile for the masses and become a symbol of Italy's rebirth in the post-war era. The same year, another Italian designer, Flaminio Bertoni, who had been working in France since the 1920s, first presented his Citroën DS at the Automobile Salon of Milan. Bertoni and Giorgetto had much in common. The Varese-born Bertoni was a young prodigy who had invented pneumatic lifting for car windows and who had been discovered and brought to Paris by André Citroën. Bertoni also had a three-dimensional mind, as his work as sculptor overflowed into his work as car stylist, allowing him to author the first unibody front-wheel drive car, or Traction Avant, in 1934. The presentation of his new Citroën DS in Italy launched Bertoni's car as a model for all European cars in the 1950s and 1960s, and certainly left a profound mark on young Giorgetto. Despite these experiences, Giugiaro gradually grew dissatisfied with his job at Fiat, as none of his proposals for the Special Vehicle Styling Center were adopted, until 1959, when a new opportunity suddenly appeared. The American General Motors had commissioned the Italian coach builder Nuccio Bertone with the design of a more stylish version of the Chevrolet Corvair. Intrigued by the idea, Giugiaro sent a trial proposal to Bertone, a sketch that made so great of an impact that in December 1959, the designer immediately hired the 20-year-old prodigy, making him head of his styling center. Giugiaro's sketch would be a key inspiration for the new Chevrolet Corvair Studio of 1963, and as Bertone sold it to Alfa Romeo the same year, also the driving force behind the realization of the Alfa Romeo Sprint 2000, Giugiaro's first car. Between 1959 and 1965, Giugiaro grew under Bertone's mentorship and made a name for himself on the Turin design scene. In 1965, he left his firm to join the styling center and prototyping division of Ghia. And for the new coach builder, he presented two of his most memorable cars at the Turin Motor Show of 1966, the Maserati Ghibli and the De Tommaso Mangusta. You might recognize the Mongoose from Kill Bill 2 or Kylie Minogue's video for Can't Get You Out of My Head. Just a year later, Giugiaro left Kia, and on February 7th, 1967, with engineer Aldo Mantovani, he set up his own Ital Design, a firm that would set the car industry's agenda for the next 40 years and become one of the most sought after design companies in the world. The Volkswagen Golf project launched its global fame. We are in the fall of 1969 in the German headquarters of the company in Wolfsburg. A group of managers and engineers are discussing strategies to revitalize the brand as its famous Beetle was starting to lose sales on the market after 36 consecutive years. The 31-year-old Italian designer stands in front of them. He has been chosen by CEO Kurt Lotz and a team of recruiters who were at the Turin Auto Show, but some suspicions still linger. As Giugiaro indicates as a model for his project, the newly released Fiat 128, authored by Dante Giacosa, German engineers immediately discard his idea, supporting their claim of unfeasibility with a thorough review of measurements for the engine compartment. While answering their manufacturing questions, Giugiaro challenges their data, reeling off the technical figures of Fiat 128 from memory and inviting them to double-check his proposed measurements for the new car. A few days later, he got the job. Four years later, his Golf would reinvent the sports car and become one of the best-selling cars in automotive history. After his iconic Lotus Esprit of 1976, Giugiaro would author another best-selling vehicle in 1980, a car that he likened to a military helicopter or alternatively to a simple, practical, no frills pair of jeans. The Fiat Panda was, in his words, a light, rational machine designed for a specific purpose. And its design not only captured the imagination of generations of Italians, but also relaunched Italy's struggling automotive sector. 
Now, three other unforgettable Italian cars were authored by Giugiaro. The 1971 Alfa Sud, the first and only car manufactured in Alfa Romeo's southern plant. The 1979 Lancia Delta and the immensely popular 1993 Fiat Punto. Now, in dealing with his work, you might wonder, what made Giugiaro so successful? What is the core of his style? Well, in a way, as for many other Italian car designers, Giugiaro's idea of the automobile as a plastic work of art or a site of dynamic beauty goes back to futurist imagination. You might recall the 1909 Futurist Manifesto when, at the dawn of the automobile era, Magnetti first celebrated the beauty of engines and speed as a key trait of the modern experience. We affirm that the magnificence of the world has been enriched with a new beauty, the beauty of speed. A racing automobile with its hood adorned with large snake-like tubes with explosive breath, a roaring automobile which seems to run on a machine gun fire is more beautiful than the Nike of Samotrace, he boldly stated. Unaware of the countless design projects that would give life and form to his affirmation throughout the 20th century. In parallel with the idea of cars as plastic realizations of a dynamic and eternal beauty, another Italian trait of Giugiaro's style lies in the understanding of automobiles as projections of the self, as tools of self-fashioning. Giugiaro states, in fact, that the car is something that shows who you are. It is important because it enables you to move around and it makes you freer. It's like fashion. Different types of people are attracted by different brands and models, and your car is a status symbol to show who you are, what you think, and what you would like to be. So to recapitulate, speed, evolution, and innovation, but also self-expression, fashion, and the everlasting pursuit of freshness. It follows that a car, like an outfit, is the site of an ever-dynamic beauty, endowed simultaneously with variety and fullness creativity and performance, modernity and eternity. The cars that most embody this ideal and which represent Giugiaro's own self-portrait are the Bugatti EB112, which he designed for himself in 1993, and the electric concept car Sibilla, which he dedicated to his mother in 2018 and recalled his first breakthrough project, the 1963 Chevrolet Corvair Testudo. His idea of a three-dimensional beauty in motion extended beyond the automotive industry and was applied to life itself, as confirmed by his innumerable and diverse projects for Ital design, from weapons for Beretta to motorcycles for Ducati, from his watches for Seiko to his cameras for Nikon. Giugiaro's pencil is also behind ambitious architectural projects like the Juventus Stadium of Turin, the Rihad Metro, and the 7,000 pipe organ of the Cathedral of Lausanne in Switzerland. If I were to pick my favorite Giugiaro object, I would probably choose the official basketball he designed for Molten, which has now been regularly adopted in all FIBA competitions. To be completely honest, however, I would be remiss if I didn't talk to you about the pasta shape that Giugiaro designed for the manufacturer Voiello in 1983. The Marille were, in his words, two Volkswagen wheels with a tail, engineered to retain as much sauce as possible. The project was surrounded by great expectations and was even endorsed by Newsweek, but Giugiaro's pasta did not take off, ultimately failing the test of the market. The Marille story proves the breadth of Giugiaro's interests, but also reveals an important lesson, that great breakthroughs are often surrounded by many unsuccessful projects. All great designers or innovators fail, and quite often, think of the many Apple products that Steve Jobs launched without success. The test of their genius, then, is not failure, but what happens afterwards, when a mistake turns into a step forward, when a comeback becomes a discovery, when the audacity to start over leads to true innovation. It is that relentless willingness to walk, experiment, and learn that truly characterizes a great innovator. 
Giugiaro's legacy is the outcome of this lifelong journey. A journey that found its ratification in the inclusion of Giugiaro among the speakers at the 1981 International Conference of Aspen, the Italian idea, in his six awards for design, the so-called Compasso d'Oro, and in his 2002 induction into the Automotive Hall of Fame. His journey continues even after the sale of Ital Design to the Volkswagen Group, which was followed by the 2015 establishment of his new firm GFG with his son Fabrizio. From the beginnings to the present, Giugiaro's creative journey continues to stem from a blank sheet of paper and a blue Stettler mechanical pencil, or rather, from the practice of sketching and trying, from the passion of 3D projecting, from the awareness that design is as much about drawing ideas as it is about executing them. In his words, I was always into the constructability of the product. Anyone can draw a car, but that's it. It's just a drawing, unless you think about what the engineers have to do to make it real. That's the excitement in designing something that can be made. I was never interested in just drawing something cool. So meaning is the vision behind the execution. And execution is the three-dimensional expression of meaning. Beauty is the outcome of this dynamism, which cannot be crystallized once and for all, but needs to be achieved from time to time in multiple expressions. The roots of this operative and aesthetic vision are what Giugiaro calls the creative poverty of the stylus, the Latin word for pen. It is in the simplicity of a handheld pen of distinctive trait that an original style and a truly new idea can be found. For him, hand drawing is the condition to become aware of the sunlight, giving an object its shades and depth, to discover an intimate connection with the project, as the hand, he says, is more connected to our brain than our machines, and ultimately to acquire the discipline of proportions, what he called math that becomes beauty, or rather, beauty that becomes math. His one-to-one -one scale sketches did not stop on the uneven or rough surfaces of a wall or paper, but turn into 3D projections. The acquired discipline of lateral sections became a testing mindset, and the simplicity of exactitude became a force of invention and beauty, as two-dimensional lines turn into objects and products turn into three-dimensional pieces of art. Thank you very much for watching and stay tuned for a little extra after this. If you like this presentation, I invite you to subscribe to this YouTube channel or to the webpage www.italianinnovators.com to receive notifications of new episodes. You can also follow me on my LinkedIn profile or on Instagram at Italian Innovators for additional materials about the show. Thanks again. Arrivederci e alla prossima.